the last keynote lecture is Andrea Prato, mm -hmm. a postdoctoral research at INRIM. In INRIM, yes. Welcome, nice to meet you. Um, I want to thank uh, Dario Dorazio for the, for the invitation and also to the scientific, uh, scientific committee. Uh, it, it's a pleasure for me to be, to be here. Um, my name is Andrea Prato and I work at the National Institute of Meteorological uh, Research. And uh, today I will present uh, the work that uh, our research team carried out uh, uh, about low frequency uh, noise in general in the last uh, uh, five uh, years. So my presentation will be divided mainly in two parts. The first one will, regard, uh, will be focused on the effects of low frequency noise on humans, while the second one will be focused on uh, uh, laboratory measurements of building acoustics at, uh, at low frequencies, which was uh, the main part of my PhD. So, humans are sensitive to sounds in the region between 20 hertz and uh, 20 uh, kilohertz, and uh, low frequency noise is uh, um, indicated in the region mainly between 20 hertz and 200 hertz. So, just uh, a beginning of what uh, frequency, uh, what uh, frequencies we are considering. There are uh, many, many kind of low frequency noise sources, and low frequency noise is a, a common. Uh, um, background noise in urban environments as uh, an emission from many artificial sources. We can, we can have uh, machinery noise, we have audio equipment noise from uh, uh, concerts, outdoor concerts, ventilation and air conditioning system, road traffic noise, aircraft, and of course uh, wind turbines. So there are very lot of uh, uh, sources that a lot of people do not consider mainly in their ordinary life. So we know that the sensitivity of human hearing at low frequencies is much lower than for mid-high frequencies as depicted, depicted in the, um, the curves of uh, equal loudness. And uh, so in general we need uh, more energy at low frequencies in order to have the same loudness than for high and mid frequencies. So this is very important when we consider this. And from this loudness curve, we had the, uh, the um, derivation of all weighting curves, so the A curve that correspond to the 40 phone curves. Uh, curves. So we have a, a large attenu attenuation of low frequencies for the A curve. Then there is the B curve, the D curve, the C curve, etc. So uh, we just have to remember that most of low frequency noise, especially uh, outdoor uh, and uh, environmental noise, is measured with uh, uh, this uh, weighting curve, so the A curve, that attenuate a lot, lot uh, low frequencies. Um, while most noise within the low frequency range is perceived by the normal hearing system, uh, vibration of the body also results uh, from low frequency noise. This is very important since uh, uh, humans are, uh, uh, can uh, uh, percept vibration from uh, uh, 0.5 Hz until 100 kHz. And, but uh, our body is mainly affected by um, frequencies between uh, 0.5 Hertz and uh, uh, 200 Hertz. So, so the main uh, uh, sensitivity of vibration is uh, in the low frequency range. So when we, um, when we perceive noise, we have to consider both aspects, so acoustical one and vibrating ones. So this could be an explanation why we have incongruous uh, results when we just evaluate acoustic phenomena, and we don't uh, consider also vibrational ones. Uh, low frequency noise is also um, very effective because uh, it uh, propagates over long distances out, uh, outdoors and also 
coincides with the poor sound insulation in buildings. So here we, we can see the typical uh, sound insulation curves and we have that around the resonant frequencies of partition we have a um, small attenuation of, uh, uh, of noise that uh, um, is represented in the region in, of low frequencies. Many, many papers have been uh, uh, written and report uh, low frequency uh, noise effect on humans. The main ones are uh, psychophysical stress, impaired task performance, insomnia or, this, or sleep disturbances, the cardiovascular problems, uh, temporal and permanent uh, threshold sh shift, and uh, pressure in here. So there are a lot of uh, uh, effects on, uh, on human being. As told you before, in this first part, I will uh, show you one of the experiments that we have carry out, uh, carried out and we are still uh, carrying, uh, carrying out in, uh, in, our, uh, in our laboratories. Um, in this one, we, uh, we show you an experimental procedure for the evaluation of low frequency noise effects on, uh, on humans. I want to thank my colleagues Dr. Laura Rossi and uh, uh, Lorenzo Lesina for their uh, support and for their, for their work. So in the last th uh, th uh, 30 years, a um, um, lot of work that study the effect of low frequency noise on humans are based only on, on questionnaires. And basing our results on, only on, uh, on uh, questionnaires, we, we get incongruous uh, results and uncomparable ones. So this is due to the fact that uh, uh, subjective, just uh, subjective evaluation is not sufficient in order to evaluate um, annoyance or effects of uh, an external stimuli on humans. So one of the solutions is soft metrology. Soft metrology is a new branch of metrology which, taking, which takes into account uh, different aspects and tries uh, to, um, to, to bring a, a metrological methodology in the evaluation of humans. Um, a first definition appeared in uh, an MPL report, MPL is the English Metrology Institute in 2003 and say that uh, soft, metrology, uh, soft metrology is a set of measurement techniques and models which enable the objective quantification of properties which are, which are determined by human perception. The human response may be in any of the five senses, sight, smell, sound, taste and touch. So based on this new branch we try to measure humans in different, uh, in different ways, so starting from uh, effects of noise, effects of, uh, um, of, of different external stimuli. One of the main characteristics of uh, soft metrology is uh, uh, the, the methodology, which can be divided in three steps. First one is the plan uh, of measurement setup, so I, I have to define which are my experimental environments, if laboratory or in situ. We have to choose which are the disturbing um, disturbing signals, which could be noise or light or whatever we want to measure. We had to characterize the subjects, the samples, so for, for example, age, gender, audiometric test, and psychometric test. And also, we have to quantificate the effect due to the uh, psychophysical stress. This is one of the main core. So, when we evaluate uh, annoyance or stress or um, any effect of an external stimuli, we have uh, to um, combine all these three outputs, which are uh, performance output, for example, a Stroop test, a physiological output, for, for example, a heart rate that we'll see in this, uh, this work, and also a psychological output like a questionnaire. So we want just to base our research on questionnaires, but we want to evaluate all three aspects. And this is one of the main core of this branch. So as told you before, in this work we wanted to evaluate the effect of low frequency noise on humans. So we, uh, we set in laboratory condition, in this case uh, an anechoic chamber, hemi-anechoic chamber, where there are two loudspeakers with a cone membrane of uh, 15 inches. 
and the subjects are uh, uh, um, are seated in the in the middle between the the two loudspeakers. We we have not used any um, any headphones in order in order to have the the whole the whole body sensation. As told you before, low frequencies are not just a, a hearing phenomenon, but it is a, a whole body phenomenon. So we wanted to uh, have the subject immerse directly in the sound field. We had also we also have linearized the, the frequency response in order to uh, avoid the uh, uh, resonance uh, of the of the loudspeakers and uh, of the room since uh, our anechoic chamber has a cutoff frequency of uh, 90 hertz. We also choose uh, three kind of noises. The first one was uh, stochastic noise uh, which was uh, um, which had a lot of mid-high frequencies, so we, um, with um, um, a burst of sine waves that started and stopped every uh, point, uh, um, 25 seconds. So we have this stochastic sine wave noise. The same was uh, done for low frequency noise, so um, the same stochastic noise, but with the main components between 20 and 200 hertz. And the third sound was a, a real sound that was recorded uh, at um, 20 meters from a wind turbine uh, uh, source. So here are depicted, depicted all the spectra. And all stimuli has been uh, uh, administered at uh, 85 dBA each. Uh, in this experiment, we had 25 subjects, and um, we also but we had uh, 12 females and 13 uh, males, and we also set a, a threshold for what consider um, for what concern uh, the audiometric test in order to um, in order to avoid any outlier. After that, we uh, administer. All the subject uh, a personality test. These uh, have been uh, um, a, a fundamental step for the analysis of data, as we will see to, uh, later. In particular, with the, this uh, standardized Isenk uh, personality questionnaire, we could evaluate which of if a subject, if a particular subject was introvert or extrovert. These results uh, from uh, um, few papers that. Uh, um, that report that noise beyond 60 dBAs causes greater stress in introverts than extroverts with measurable consequences. So this could be one of the reasons why we had incongruous results when we do not divide subject in, this, in these two categories. So between introverts and extroverts for what concerns annoyance, of course. As a um, cognitive test or performance test, we use a, a Stroop test, which is a quite standardized uh, test. Um, this test measures the dilation of response times in humans in presence of conflict between significance and significant. So in this case, subject has to um, ans um, answer the question, what is the color of the word written in the center of the screen? So we have the, um, the word uh, purple written in red, so they had to press red. And we recorded the, the response time. We had uh, five Stroop FX situation, so we had uh, uh, administered uh, the, the free noises plus a silence at the beginning and at the end of our experiments. Experiment. In total, we administered 160 uh, questions with the three levels of difficulty. So, simple, medium, and uh, uh, difficult. Uh, each subject has the same li list of questions, but they were uh, uh, distributed ran randomly in order to avoid an, any systematic effect. And we also administered 50 questions. Uh, we, um, 50 uh, trivial questions in order to form a sort of baseline. This is crucial in order to have a sort of normalization of subject and uh, to respond to different uh, uh, preliminary, um, uh, preliminary uh, properties of our subject. So in particular when 
the question appears, we have different step of timing. So at the beginning, each subject uh, perceives the stimulus, then he ponders and decides what to answer, then there is the, the time for the reaction, for, for example, the, the click of the mouse, and then at the end there is the, the time uh, for the machine to receive the mouse click and uh, um, register the answer. So we have a lot of steps of timings, and uh, if we reorder, we can have two main, uh, we can divide uh, all these timings in, in two main ones. The first one is the baseline, which is different from subjects to, to, to subjects, and these are evaluated with uh, trivial questions. So trivial questions allowed us to evaluate this baseline, because our main obje uh, uh, goal was to evaluate the response time, so the time that subjects uh, take to ponder and decide which answer is the, is the correct one. So all our response time has been normalized, so we just uh, uh, made the difference between the total response, si uh, response time and the baseline in order to, com to compare just this extra time. We also correct for what concerns learning and fatigue effects. So in the, in the first and last condition, which were the silence condition, we could, we, we, we could have a learning effect if uh, the slope of the linear fit of the mean response time were uh, decreasing. So in this case, there is learning. So we just corrected odd values in order to avoid this, uh, this, uh, uh, this effect. And the same as for uh, fatigue. So if uh, uh, a subject um, gets, uh, gets tired during the, the experiment, so the response time is uh, increased, we just corrected also this one. So with the, with, with the baseline and with this uh, uh, fit, we could correct all our data in order to uh, have a sort of normalization of, 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 all, our, of all our data. Uh, here we uh, have all the response, all the mean response times of all subjects for the three uh, level of difficulty, so simple, medium, and difficult, with the, the four uh, conditions: so the silence, with the, the wide band noise um, centered at mid high frequencies, low frequency noise, and the wind turbine noise. There are basically no differences, so. If there is noise, or, or at least there are no uh, consistent differences, as if, if we take into account the, the uncertainty of our mean, uh, mean data, there are uh, no consistent differences. We can see that, that, that there is a slight uh, decrease in mean response times in presence of noise, which, uh, 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 which corresponds to uh, a little more stress. Now I will, I will explain you why. But basically, or statistically, there are no differences between this graph. So we try to divide our subject between introverts and extroverts according to Isaac theory. And basically we find that uh, the difference between uh, the, re the mean response times between noise and silence are all negatives. So we have uh, uh, a, an increase of performance in noise condition, but the only significant differences are the ones related to low frequency noise and wind turbine noise, as we can see the p-value here. So we can consider true just these two values for the, the difficult task. Uh, for, for what concerns extroverts, we also, we also see that, that there are negative values, but no one is significant. If we uh, translate this data into a graphic, we can see that for extroverts, uncertainties are too large in order to see any difference between uh, the different conditions. But for introverts, we can see that there are differences, especially for, for the difficult task, where we can see that uh, with the low frequencies, noise and uh, wind turbine noise, um, the mean response time is, is, uh, is, um, is decreased compared to the silence condition. So this, uh, according to the arousal, arousal theory, a symptom of stress. Because arousal theory um, says that uh, if, um, um, 
if a performance is affected by an external stimuli, we have an increase in response time, which, uh, uh, which corresponds to a more stressful situation for a certain amount of time after another, uh, after um, the, the peak of this curve, so with the uh, increasing timings, we get tired, so our performance decreases. Our experiment lasted around uh, 10 minutes, so we can exclude that could be any fatigue uh, effects, or maybe there are small uh, effects of, uh, of, uh, of fatigue. So the, 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 the decrease of response time is uh, corresponding to an increase of stress. We also evaluate the heart rate, as told uh, before. So we, uh, for all subjects, we recorded their heart rate during the experiment, so during trivial questions, during, during silence conditions, during noisy conditions. And we could evaluate a baseline and, uh, uh, during trivial question and uh, uh, their heart rate during the Stroop test uh, with noises. We divided between introverts and extroverts. So we can see that for extroverts, there are no difference. So all the um, deviations from the baseline are uh, null. For introverts, uh, otherwise, we can see that uh, there are uh, some differences. So during the Stroop test, the heart rates of introverts uh, increased a lot. So this is another symptom of stress, and this is another confirmation that the facts that um, dividing the, our subjects in these two groups was fundamental in order to evaluate the effects of low frequency noise. So in the conclusion of this first part, we can see that soft metrology, which is the, the the summation of all these effects uh, allows a direct comparison of subjective results, allowing for a better understanding and accurate qualification of effects of noise. Um, low frequency noise uh, produce comparable physical and cognitive effects, or maybe greater than for mid high uh, wideband noise. And also, the subdivision between uh, introvert and extrovert was crucial in order to, uh, to have some, uh, some uh, uh, significant results. And at the end, we can see that the A weighting curve is not sufficient in order to evaluate the low frequency noise effect. This is uh, um, obviously, this is obvious since we do not percept uh, low frequency just with our hearing, but with our whole body. So we have to take into account also vibrational aspect. The second part regards my PhD uh, thesis, my, my, my PhD results about the building acoustics measurement at low frequencies. So uh, we know from the actual standards that there is a, um, an extension of st standard laboratory measurements down to 50 Hz. So all standards start from 100 Hz until 5 kHz. But uh, all frequencies below 100 Hz are completely, are, are, um, completely uh, neglected. So we wanted to um, increase such, uh, um, such frequency region to all uh, um, measurements in laboratory that concern airborne sun insulation, impact sun insulation, and also for reverberation time. In the, in the, in the low frequency range, we especially in small uh, in small rooms, we have uh, uh, standing waves, which, uh, com uh, which uh, are uh, um, characterized by non-diffuse field conditions. So we have uh, a lot of fl fluctuation of uh, sound pressure levels uh, in frequency and space domains. So this is one of the main uh, problems for what concerns laboratory airborne sound insulation, where we have uh, standing waves in, in, in both rooms. So we have uh, um, a strong dependence on geometry and, we, and the strong dependence on, on uh, laboratory uh, conditions. So we have a low reproducibility of the sound reduction index. So we, we evaluated a new index, which is based on the transmission of modes from the source room into the receiving room. And we evaluated it uh, with uh, measurements performed in, in, in our laboratory. Here we can see the spectrum of the source uh, room and the spectrum of the receiving room. And uh, we can see that uh, we define this model sound insulation index as the difference between uh, the uh, sound uh, pressure levels of source room modes 
that occurs in both rooms. So in this case, we found this uh, model sound insulation curve that coincides exactly with the resonant frequency of the, of the, um, of the partition. So this is not a reproducibility um, validation because we just perform measurement in our laboratories, but in the future we want to extend it. Okay, I have to stop because I have no more time. I have just a, a few slides more, but if you have questions, you are welcome. Thank you. Two slides more. I will just show you maybe something about not impact sound insulation, but for re re reverberation times and low frequencies. Also, in this case, we, uh, um, in a, a scientific literature, it is reported that uh, low uh, frequencies, reverberation time measurements are affected by a lot of inaccuracies and. Uh, uh, large uncertainties. This is due to the fact that in one third octave band and low frequencies can occur more room modes that have different decays. So we have non-linear decay, so it is very difficult to perform measurement in third octave bands. Um, in particular, here we can see uh, a measurement of, uh, uh, or, or a simulation of uh, um, reverberation times of modes that occur in a room. And we can see that there are uh, that the modes has longer decaying times, and in particular, these are the main cause of rumble effects. So, in non-diffuse fields, so in modal fields, we have rumble effects instead of uh, uh, um, uh, reverberant effects because we are in non-diffuse fields. So, just the the main uh, important part are modes. So, we try to evaluate uh, two methods in order to evaluate reverberation times, focusing on modes, also in this case, as for sound insulation. So we evaluated a, a direct method. So we just evaluated the decay of single modes, exciting the room with an, an anti, um, anti-resonant uh, sine wave. That was the best in order to evaluate the, uh, the single decays. And also an indirect, indirect method using this formula. So we have a direct correlation between uh, the decay of single modes and their uh, uh, half uh, bandwidth evaluated uh, during uh, uh, with uh, with measurement of, of 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 spectrum. So we just perform spectrum measurements of the, the response time of room, and we could evaluate the its uh, uh, half bandwidth. So according to this formula, we could evaluate with the sweep uh, signal all normal mode of of the room. We evaluated the uh, the half bandwidth of, of each mode, and we could evaluate the reverberation times. And then we put all measurements together, so both the direct and indirect methods with the third octave band me um, measurements. And we can see that uh, the, the model reverberation times have uh, uh, smaller uncertainties, and maybe they are more accurate with respect to standard ones that are performed with third octave bands. So this is just a summary of uh, our results. Okay, thank you. There are some questions? No? So, I think that model reverberation time will be treated in the... Yes. <laughs> yeah. I will continue uh, to talk uh, about uh, the mo room modes, not only that. Uh, so uh, I started talking about the objectives of this uh, small experiment we carried out this year. Uh, the experimental setup, uh, the room uh, specifications and measure methodologies. Uh, we'll do a brief small room acoustic uh, recap of the theory, RT measurements and space dispersion uh, sorry. Thank you. So let's see. Do you see it? Okay. Sorry. 
as I was saying, uh, uh, I'll talk about RT measurements and space dispersion estimation. Uh, then about uh, the room time response. Uh, we use uh, a method that is called uh, audio quality test. I will talk about it. And uh, I will finish uh, paragonating the third octave RT, uh, uh, reverberation time, against frequency decay measurements, all in the low frequencies. Uh, so in, uh, in February, we had uh, disposition uh, an empty room. Uh, it was actually an empty bedroom. Uh, it was a, a great opportunity to organize some experiments. We wanted to test the differences between using uh, uh, the direct method uh, of uh, calculating the uh, reverberation time against the sign sweep method, the indirect method. This is because we have been working a lot uh, with the, um, uh, smartphones. We, we have been develop developing some applications on smartphones for acoustic measurements. We wanted uh, somehow to validate again uh, the audio quality test method and then uh, test our uh, low frequency transient analysis algorithms in a very reflective room. Uh, generally, we use uh, these uh, uh, algorithms uh, we developed uh, in the last 10 years for uh, rooms for music, so very damped uh, rooms. So the, 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 scope of the actual scope of the experiment was participating in a round robin test it was a very interesting uh, uh, study that was presented uh, this year in Pavia. Uh, so it, it was uh, made of a, a large room and a small ante room. Uh, we did the measurements for this uh, round robin test using a, a wooden clapper. Uh, which actually was uh, the, the most used uh, method by the professional teams that were participating to this uh, uh, round robin test. So we, we tried also using the, uh, uh, we used the sign sweep method also to, to test the room and we did some direct recording of sign parts as uh, specific frequencies. We, we used our own uh, professional uh, uh, instrumentation, so we, we said we have a subwoofer, we just left it on the, on the uh, floor, then we will see what this uh, did. But the clapper is a very primitive uh, method to use uh, to study reverberation time, it's very fast. Uh, and it is actually allowed because the uh, ISO uh, 3382 permits direct uh, inputs as long as the input itself is not uh, reverberant. This is uh, some measurements we did in open air conditions uh, th three years ago. And uh, the clapper actually has uh, its own decay, especially at, uh, at quite low frequency. So it, it has a 0 0.2 second uh, bias at 100 hertz. Well, we all know the limits of the uh, direct method for assessing the reverberation time is that uh, every iteration is uh, different, it's not uh, repeatable, and uh, there is a very uneven energetic distribution of, of the inputs. The sign sweep, uh, logarithmic sign sweep, uh, uh, is, m is a much better method. Uh, we calculate uh, basically an inverse filter and we use uh, a simple convolution uh, to obtain uh, the pure uh, input response of the room, the, the HT. It gives a very good re rejection of the system nonlinearities. Let's remember uh, something of uh, room acoustic theory. We know the critical frequency, the Schroeder frequency, is the one that separates a statistical behavior in the higher frequencies. Uh, so a more Sabinian behavior from a de de deterministic one where these standing waves exist on the lower ones. In this case, in this room, uh, uh, was very reverberant uh, the uh, critical frequency is uh, 318 hertz. The theory, we have these uh, simple theories, uh, regular sh box-shaped rooms, uh, we can easily calculate the eigenfrequencies. Uh, there is the green function that describes uh, the uh, frequency response of the room. So we have uh, valleys uh, and dips, as we saw before in uh, Dr. Prati uh, presentation. This depends a lot uh, about the damping factor of each mode, basically. So let's see some results 
these are the, the RT values for the two methods. So blue is the clapper, uh, red is the sign sweep. We see that uh, up to the f critical frequency they are uh, almost identical, 315 Hz. And below there is uh, a large discrepancy. A very large discrepancy is like uh, 0.5 seconds at uh, 80 Hz. So uh, this is not... Uh, um, explainable just by the known clapper bias that we saw was just 0.2 seconds. We know that uncertainty in um, acoustic measurements is, is done by acoustics, so the room physical property from the procedure we use and from the instrumentation we are uh, using. A, a first uh, measure of this partial dispersion can be estimating the relative standard deviation of, of our uh, measurements. We, we did uh, 30 measurements in this small room, and so we wanted to see how dispersed is the uh, reverberation time in, uh, of our measurements. So we, when we comp uh, compare the clapper against the sign sweep on 30 measurements, we have the same room, so the same acoustic uncertainty, the same recording hardware, but we have a very different measure methodologies, we have a very different source type, and different source positioning. So actually, uh, the, subwoofer, the subwoofer always on the floor was actually affecting the spatial excitation we were giving to the room. So the, our RSD is the first estimate of the spatial dispersion of the sound field uh, uh, of the two methodologies. So here we have the, uh, in the bars, we have the RSD, and we see that the RSD increases uh, uh, below the uh, Schroeder frequency. It gets higher than 10% uh, uh, below the 315 Hertz. We, we see, also see that the clapper method is very, very uncertain uh, below 125 Hertz. You see the, the bars are much, much higher. The sign sweep is more precise. When we focus on this more on the low frequency, we see that the number of active resonant modes is very small in each third octave band. We, have, we see just one, two, one, two. So it's a very small number of, of active resonant modes. And the source positioning uh, uh, and the microphone positioning are very important uh, to affect the spatial variability of, the, uh, of our measure. It depends if we set the, the source on a node or an anti-node of vibration. Uh, now, in the second part, uh, if, we w if we want to analyze better the uh, low frequency decay with a more specific uh, uh, consideration frequency per frequency, we can use this method that was uh, developed by Noxon and Liberatore uh, some years ago. So we can reproduce pure tongue bars at low frequency and record them as they are modified by the room. Here we can uh, we overlap them. We have a, a an attack uh, phase, a steady state phase, and a decay phase. This is our the room response. Uh, Angelo Farina uh, put this method into digitally, in a, a, in a digital algorithm. So it's uh, called a QT2. We can do a, a digital convolution between our uh, HT, our uh, room response, with single tone bars. Here we can study very well the steady state response, the dynamic response, and the decay time measurement uh, at each frequency. So first, uh, we wanted to validate this, uh, this method. You know, we, we never did a validation. So we actually did the AQT digitally, so with the algorithm, but we also recorded pure sign bars in, a, in the actual room. So we want to compare the reality versus our uh, simplification, our digitalization. And we got that uh, our digitalization, that is uh, just the envelope study you see in, in the red line, is exactly the same as the envelope of the, of the measure. Of course, the, there is not a, perf a, a, a match because in reality we see a lot of high frequency rippling. This is due to our uh, subwoofer that was not very linear, basically. Th that, that's the first uh, explanation I can give. So we can see at resonance what happens. This was a, in a resonance, uh, and the, but the microphone was not very well placed. Just by moving the microphone, we have a, a much more stable and a better response. When we set uh, the uh, subwoofer in an antenna node, we get a completely different uh, uh, dynamic behavior. We have an opening transient, 
and then we have a closure transient, like an RLSC, uh, 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 what we call it, uh, um, in, 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 in electric techniques. So, so we have an attack phase. Uh, this is very critical in music. Uh, when we are listening music, we are listening uh, bass, we are li listening to drums, uh, kick drums. Uh, if we focus on single uh, uh, burst modifications, we see that if we are in peaks, so in resonant peaks, we have a, a slow uh, charging of the room and then a release of the room. When we are in anti-nodes, uh, we have uh, the overshoot behavior. The middle one is the ideal one, that the, the ideal situation that we find just in some frequencies. What is interesting is, is that uh, uh, the development uh, it, it depends on the duration of the note. We see that when the note is very short, the room never gets to to the most uh, to the steady state actually uh, regime. If it's very short, uh, the opening and the closing transient uh, on, on the right hand side are uh, overlapping. We can basically uh, uh, get uh, a, a response uh, just by seeing uh, the very beginning of, of the response of the room. We call it this overshoot response. It's also called the dynamic response of the room. Uh, the steady state, which is actually FFT, just comes after the, the beginning of the transient. What we generally see as a uh, as a frequency study of the room, actually, is just the steady state situation, and when and the sounds are very short, they're not e even reached. It's, it's not excited. So here we see the steady state uh, analysis. So the classical FFT of our room, uh, the lines are, are the room modes, uh, the calculated room modes. So we see there is a good match until about 150 hertz. Uh, then we have to remember that there is the anteroom, okay, that kicks in, and there are the tangential, the oblique modes that uh, work. And this is the overshoot, uh, so the dynamic frequency analysis. So looking just uh, at the very beginning of the transient of the room, we see uh, what we see is that uh, this room is very resonant, so it's underdamped. Uh, very reflective sur surfaces, so the, there is a still a very good match between calculated axial eigenfrequencies and the measured response. We see that the dynamic response is uh, still quite similar to the FFT, but it has a, uh, a much lower level variations. You see the FFT has uh, like 10, 15 decibel variations. The dynamic response is much smaller. Uh, the decay is very interesting. The slow decay times uh, create overlaps between the closing transients of sounds, so it, cr it creates confusion, especially in music, and it can get to poor speech intelligibility, even if uh, the voice content at low frequency is, is not so important for intelligibility. So we, we can directly measure the decay time uh, just by studying uh, each uh, sign bust uh, modified. Uh, the point is that uh, it, it is difficult to, to, to say what is the decay time. We decided to uh, st study the decay time from steady state. Because especially in under situation, you see there is always the, the transient that, that is quite uh, important. It gets a 3, 4, 5 dB higher than, uh, uh, than steady state. So we measured from that. In this way, we can plot the frequency, uh, the decay time in frequency. We can give a very precise uh, measurement, uh, frequency per frequency. Here we overlap uh, the FFT in red, and uh, in the dashed line, the, uh, me the measured uh, decay time of the room. We see there is a still a match between the room modes and, uh, and the decay time, even if it's not so precise anymore. This is a, quite an interesting effect. Last thing we did was about uh, comparing the uh, reverberation time measurements to these uh, uh, decay time measurements, FFT decay time measurements. And we wanted to see what happens increasing the number of measurements. 
So we, we started using a survey quality measurements, so just uh, two measurements uh, from our Science Whip uh, campaign. And there is, of course, a very large difference uh, be be between uh, these uh, estimate uh, and uh, the larger number averages, especially below 315 Hertz. Using an engineering quality, six measures, we get better estimates. So we have problems just uh, below 125 Hertz. So this actually confirms what, what the uh, norm tells us. Tells us that uh, until 100 Hertz, we, we, we don't uh, we don't have such a big error. We get to 12 measurements. We, we have a still difference below 80 Hertz, and when we get to the maximum quality, we need uh, 30 measures. So being a very resonant room, uh, in this case, uh, we found that the reverberation time actually is a good average parameter to facilitate uh, the decay time analysis we do in frequency. Actually, we never find this in damped rooms. This was, uh, <laughs> for us, it was a, a, a new finding. The RT reverberation time is uh, still very difficult dangerous uh, if we want to do a, a very uh, accurate analysis uh, for musical uh, purposes, so for studio rooms, uh, because it's too simplified. In, in one octave band, so we have uh, 12 uh, uh, semitones. So the conclusions, uh, we had a very resonating room, a very resonating room, so it was made of masonry, so very reflective surfaces. Was, uh, for us, it was the first time to, to do uh, extensive uh, controls on such a room. And uh, actually to facilitate uh, the use of reverberation time at low frequency, we have a good match between uh, the Schroeder frequency and, and the distinct behavior of, of the room, as we saw in the low frequency and the high frequency. Well, uh, RT is very precise if we do a very high number of measurements. So if we, have a, if we want to do a, a good uh, estimate of reverberation on time, we need to do 30 measurements if we want to, to stay below 80 hertz. That, that it's not uh, a small number of measurements. Uh, the sign sweep method is more precise. Well, of course, we already knew this. Uh, we also confirmed that the clapper, the, the clapper anyway, is, uh, is good enough for building acoustics. If we want to, to do a measurement of uh, uh, um, sound isolation, as uh, was uh, talked before, uh, the clapper is, is a good one. I, even the research from Campo Longo and Scrosati proved this. The, the, using the clapper, they got a good uncertainty. The QT method is a robust and accurate dynamic time analysis and LFE of low frequency, and our next research will be on damped rooms, so with gypsum board surfaces, complex acoustic impedance. Okay, here is a small bibliography of what I talked, and uh, I thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for one question. One question. I have one. Yeah. Did you evaluate the dispersion of your results? I mean, for more reverberation time in space. So you measure in different positions, right? Yeah, it was always in very different uh, positions. Okay. So in uh, in the clapper situation, the clapper was never in the same uh, position. Mm -hmm. So this this is why uh, we have such a big dispersion at low frequencies. Okay. No, this no, could I mean, can uh, be a reason. Uh, dispersion of reverberation times because. You just saw, I think, average or mean values, right? Or you have no. The dispersion is the RSD. We did it with the RSD ah, okay. of the measurements. So this is this is the dispersion ah, okay. as an RSD measure of the 30 measurements. So it's interesting because the science whip uh, having the subwoofer on the floor uh, does uh, uh, affects at the 63 and 80 hertz. Uh, using a clapper that is always in a different, is never in the same position. No? It's yes. very statistical. This increases the dispersion. So one of the reasons. Uh, the clapper then does never has the same energy, you know. 
know. It's very uneven and is a re re resonant in itself. So it, of course it's not a good uh, instrument. Sweep is much better. Yeah, the sense sweep is much better. And it's very interesting that the RST increases uh, very much up below the Schroeder frequency. This is very interesting. Thank you. Okay, next uh, presentation from Donato Masci. Uh, the title is Low Frequency Analysis for Recording Studio Design. I am Donato Masci. <coughs> I work um, in a firm, uh, Studio Sound Service in Florence. Uh, it's an acoustic design firm and uh, we design uh, recording studios um, and audio facility in, in general, but also other things. I'm, uh, so I'm an acoustic designer, I'm not a researcher, so today I will talk about uh, <coughs> low frequency analysis for recording studio design, but uh, it's not a scientific uh, uh, paper, it is only my experience and uh, my idea to develop this uh, kind of analysis for studying this kind of uh, rooms, small rooms. So we are talking about small room acoustics and uh, in particular for uh, audio production. <coughs> um, I wrote an article, uh, as usual, I wrote about two, three articles a year for this UK magazine resolution, uh, which is one of of the most important in the audio audio industry, so they are not tech scientific uh, mm, articles, but uh, they are useful for uh, whoever wants to mm, work in the uh, um, audio production. <coughs> and uh, my ideas uh, came and are just written in this in this uh, article of frequency analysis for studio design. So my first experience with, um, yeah, I, I, will, I will talk about um, FEM simulation. Uh, so um, finite element uh, simulation, in particular with console. And um, my first experience uh, came uh, working with, uh, uh, at first as a room acoustic consultant, then as coordinator of a R&D project with BNC speaker, PowerSoft, and KRA. Uh, they are three uh, electroacoustics uh, company based in the Florence area. They uh, produce transducers, amplifiers, and loudspeakers. <coughs> and in particular, uh, I have to thank Roberto Magalotti, which introduced me to Comsol. They use Comsol uh, um, for the R&D. Uh, for uh, their transducer design, and uh, we start uh, using them, uh, using it for uh, uh, room acoustic problems, in particular for this project about active absorbers. And uh, so we say, why don't try to, to, to do something for passive absorbers too? <laughs> and uh, we did a lot of measurement in a lab in the BNC speaker's room. Uh, and uh, the comparison between the measurements and the F, uh, FEM simulation are, uh, is very good. Uh, in fact, we can easily appreciate a temperature difference of uh, some degrees. When we change the temperature, it matched uh, very good. So it was <laughs> a pleasure to, to see it. Uh, before talking about uh, the FAM simulation, I would like to talk uh, uh, to tell you some something about how to design a recording studio. What's the weapon that uh, the weapons that an acoustic designer has uh, have to, to, to do it? Uh, because unfortunately, acoustic CAD software uh, can work below 100 hertz, so they can simulate the modern response of a room. Uh, okay, we use basic physics, trial and error experience, and this brings to some golden rules and designs in particular, such as LED, uh, live-ended end, and non-environment designs. <coughs> but the fact is that nobody can really know what happens at low frequency if you can design in a golden-shaped room. So the problems 
uh, are what, um, is when you uh, have to design a room <laughs> in a strange shape or smaller than what you expect, uh, and so this is not so easy. And now the things are changing. A small history of room acoustic design in comparison to some <clears throat> events on the audio industry and computer industry is a relative, um, uh, it's not really old, uh, the, this history of uh, recording studio design. So the first um, important event is Tom Midley, the first bass trap, which is a plywood uh, covered with uh, some rock wool uh, glued in the both uh, sides and placed in the in the back of uh, of the of the room. Uh, the second important is the lead live ended end, where the the front wall is uh, dead, so with absorption, and the the back is with the diffusion, so live. The third is the reflection free zone, where uh, the idea is to place a reflection free zone in the listening area, um, so um, uh, no reflection uh, came from the front in particular. And the last one, which is for the concepts in itself, probably the state of art of the recording studio design is the uh, non-environment design. <coughs> Probably the concept, not the, 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 the building itself, because uh, a lot of acousticians use this concept to, to, to have a very, a lot of absorption on the back wall, on the ceiling, and something, uh, some, something on, on the side wall, but not in the front wall, which is rigid and hard, and in the, in the floor. So the concept uh, is, this is the concept, non-environment room. But uh, the, the, the building is different. Uh, everyone uses different uh, absorbers or uh, membrane, uh, porous material, and so on. Um, so what are, what are the main problems about low frequency in the, in the, in the small rooms? I think they, are, they can mm, be divided in two branches. The, the, first, the first one is room modes, of course, because we, have to, we need to have um, a flat, uh, flat room response, so we have to uh, have small uh, discrepancy between maxima and minima in a, in a room, and just, you know, it's easy to have 20 or 30 dBs from maximum and minima, so it is not easy to have a flat response. Uh, and the other main problem is the loudspeaker room interaction, so speaker boundary uh, that brings to no, meaningful, no minimum phase effects and brings to the frequency response tips and problems at low frequencies. So uh, we really need to know what happens at low frequencies changing the room design and size. Uh, last, last thing I show you is nice because <laughs> it's different from a uh, acoustics, but uh, this helps you to understand what happens in the last uh, 20 years in the room acoustics, uh, in the recording studio industry. Uh, the studio equipment uh, costs uh, are, are getting lower and lower, so it's nice mm, to, to say that uh, probably everyone can uh, build a, a studio, uh, professional recording itself, uh, without spending a lot of money. But unfortunately, standing ways cost the same. <laughs> so the rooms are the same, physics is the same, and uh, the idea is that the, the rooms are getting smaller and smaller. And this is very difficult for us. Just for a comparison, uh, the Italian golden disc uh, uh, in the 1995 is 5,000 uh, disc sold and now is uh, a half, but nobody sells it. <laughs> so um, the studios are getting cheaper and smaller. So we need to find different and good designs all for, also for smaller rooms. So this is the reason why I, I start using the FEM uh, console. And uh, I will show you three cases, case histories. 
the first the, the first case is a um, room mode uh, study, a comparison with, between an op optimal dimension rectangular room, a Loudon, this mm, ratio, versus a similar non-rectangular one. Why I, I, I choose it? Because there are a lot of um, school of thinkings about uh, choosing the right room and the right uh, mm, mm, uh, dimension ratio. Uh, somebody tells that, uh, okay, we have formula for a rectangular room, so just use the rectangular one. <laughs> somebody says, no, it's better to have slanted rooms, symmetrical, but not uh, par uh, parallel walls. So um, the fact is that it's notable that the slanted room, so a room with uh, not parallel side walls, has more sound energy at low frequency. Uh, this is a comparison between a treated and untreated room in a slanted or rectangular uh, room. And the fact is that uh, it is wrong from, from my point of view to think that uh, an optimally sized room already has perfect uh, uh, frequency response without absorption. And from this comparison, you can see how uh, we can achieve similar or even better results with uh, other room designs, no rectangular one. And this could be done with console using uh, um, uh, room, this, this kind of simulations. Uh, here you can see the rectangular, no rectangular room, treat, non treated, treated, uh, and uh, you can see the acoustic pressure and SPL. You can see that the treated one has, uh, um, yeah, uh, the room is more homogeneous, and this helps, helps us to, to see. This is only the, the first mode the first longitudinal mode, and this is the first uh, um, mode that, mm, from the ceiling to the floor. <laughs> okay, uh, and this is the same. Uh, you can see that, that with the treatment, uh, the, the um, acoustic pressure is more homogeneous in, in the room. So these are some of the few modes that you can recognize in, a treat, in the treated room because it's not easy when you do, you make a good treatment for. Um, a um, uh, recording studio design to make a good comparison with an untreated and treated room because um, above 50 hertz you can recognize uh, room modes in, uh, in the treated one uh, because they degenerate and uh, it is fun to, th to see what happens. Um, so uh, you can notice, of, of course, the RT60 degrees. The model. Fr ah, this is very nice to see that um, with the treatment you can notice the model frequency shift. Uh, the room modes changes after the treatment are not the same, and this is very important because this brings us not to simulate only <clears throat> at the beginning what happens in the room in an untreated case. But you have to simulate also what happened at the end. And probably the best thing to do is to have an optimization of, of this process. Um, OK, let's see the case two. The case two is how the reverberation time changes in a room if you put an absorber on one side or in a corner. I, place, I mm, take the same room, optimal size room, and I take a, a polyester fiber <clears throat> uh, parallelepiped and place in the in a half of one side and in a corner. Just a simple um, idea, but I would like to to see what happens. Uh, I study the MT60. Is the same you 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 see? Uh, very interesting, very interesting. And just to remember that the the the, the, the acoustic field here is discrete is uh, quantized, <laughs> is, uh, is, not, uh, is not statistical. So we have to have, we, have, we need to have a look at this, not at RT, uh, if you would have a very important uh, analysis of what happens. And here you can see that the MT60 changes a lot if you place, of course, the side trap or the corner trap. Uh, I make the inverse. Uh, <laughs> formula, and I try to uh, calculate the absorption of this uh, trap if I place in the side or in a corner. And you can notice that uh, the absorption changes a lot. So uh, here, 
Sabin does not exist, <laughs> uh, is only about where, where you place that. Uh, is not statistical, is very discreet. <coughs> and this is nice to see uh, how much the room modes shift with absorption, as what I say before. Uh, the room modes shift uh, in frequency after the treatment. And this is nice because uh, for um, the side traps, shifts a lot. Uh, it's nice. <laughs> So, uh, the room acoustic field uh, is completely transformed, even uh, with the inclusion of a single bass trap. And the other thing is that, as I said, just said, simulation is important, but optimization would be better. Uh, the case tree is uh, another thing that is not so, we don't talk a lot about this, but it's very important for us that design um, studios is loudspeaker boundary effects. Uh, uh, just to understand uh, what happens uh, between uh, 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 speaker and uh, boundaries. Uh, uh, is a flush mount, uh, so is the way we place uh, loudspeaker in a professional way inside uh, uh, the room. <laughs> and this is nice because uh, we always have to say to the client that this is good but this costs a lot, and these are the result. The red curve with this flush mount is an uh, untreated room, but it's just work, and the blue one is without flush mount. Uh, so, conclusion, uh, I be fast. <laughs> Sorry, too many animation, okay. Uh, the conclusion is that I really like this, uh, this uh, tool. Uh, I will uh, try to work with this tool in the future, uh, and uh, with this tool you can uh, design uh, a room in an unconventional situation or using studying alternative and innovative acoustic treatment. But I would like to say you something uh, to the community because uh, of course I'm not a researcher but uh, uh, I, I try to, to say you something about uh, co to collaborate and uh, make something together. Of course, it's, it's far from, uh, it's, it's not easy to, to use the FEM console for the design. We need to do something. We need to, to do something to use every day. Uh, in particular, we need some libraries about impedance because we don't use reflection um, um, coefficient like absorption of uh, reflection coefficient, but we, we need to use impedance and it's not so easy to, to, to know to have. So uh, Roberto make a good uh, job, uh, to try to find uh, some impedances starting from the impulse response measurement of a room, make the reverse engineering. <laughs> uh, and uh, another nice thing I would like to say you all is the porous material we use. Uh, the porous acoustic we're using in console is uh, from uh, a Garay and Pompoli article. And this work, uh, then any Vasley doesn't work, doesn't converge. This is very interesting because I spend a lot of time searching this. <laughs> and um, yeah, this is another problem. When you have to place the source of a low frequency, you always uh, need to know where is the source in a low speaker. Is the woofer? Is the bass reflex? Is the acoustical axis? Who knows? <laughs> Only making measurements. And the last thing is that with this software, we would like to study also resonance systems, so no, no only power acoustics. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and some bibliography if you want, uh, there are some article, technical, and something else, not, not so technical, but useful. <laughs> uh, do you have s s some question? Just one, fast one. Many, yeah. but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will make just one. Um, how did you tune the absorbers for low frequencies? Mm, this I mean, is only a simulation. So, um, okay. but do you, uh, the, um, 
best traps were uh, yeah, resonant no, no. cavities uh, or uh, no, no, no. Uh, Elmos this is a, is a, uh, What I do in that kind of uh, uh, simulation is only using pore acoustics. So okay. it's only using porous material. Uh, this is not so unconventional because uh, in a lot of um, a lot of acoustician in the um, um, recording studio designers uh, uh, use only pore acoustics, not 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 a lot of resonance uh, membranes and mm -hmm. mode uh, resonators. But uh, yeah, uh, the, what I say that uh, is that the new frontier and to of course to 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 make absorbers smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. uh, probably membrane and panel absorbers are the best. So for small room, smaller rooms are a good solution, yes. but you have to tune it very, very well. And it's not, to do, it's not easy to, 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 to do a sort of um, uh, full band uh, absorber only with membranes yes. or resonators. So this is the next step. <laughs> you have to customize for each room. Yeah, the, yeah, you have to customize. You can do something. You can study some something you can repeat mm -hmm. for the design. We already try to find something you can repeat easily, uh, designing uh, rooms uh, which are not very different from the sides. So, but uh, of course you have to tune it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Next presentation from Brian Hamilton, FDT, the simulation of room acoustics, recent developments and application to a realization of Italian opera, opera house. Um, so thank you for having me, um, Dario, for inviting me um, and for putting on this nice conference. So I'm Brian Hamilton and I'll talk about uh, finite difference time domain methods uh, for simulating room acoustics and uh, some work that we do in the acoustics and audio group at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so what I'm talking about is how to derive sound from a computer model of a 3D room. So if you have some CAD model like here, some concert hall, and you want to extract um, often an impulse response. So this is what an impulse response sounds like. OK, we have sound. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so this is an impulse response of this room. Um, hopefully you can hear that. And then uh, you can take this, you can take some dry audio, for example. Techniques for acoustic simulations. So that's without reverberation, but you know, there's some for this room. And you can convolve these two to get. Techniques for acoustic simulations. Okay, so it's like as if the sound was played in that room. So this is just basic oralization. And the applications are, of course, architectural acoustics, but also these days uh, video games and virtual reality applications are very um, popular. So this is a basic kind of animation of sound propagation in a room. So I'm confining this room to two spatial dimensions, but you'll get an idea of what goes on. So we have a sound source at that point, this point mark X, and sound waves propagate through the room. Um, and typically we characterize this by you know, the direct sound. So you have the sound traveling along this straight line between a source and receiver. Um, you have uh, specular reflections where it kind of the reflections follow these geometric rules of reflection. Hopefully this goes. Okay, so then we have diffracting sound paths. So the, the waves can bend around the corners and you see also a diffracted wave which you know, will then propagate through the room and create other reflections. Um, and then at the, far, at the far right, we have a rough wall. And so when the waves hit these, then we, we call it a diffuse reflection. Um, so, you know, the sound diffuses through the room. Uh, really, this is just a combination of diffraction and specular reflections. Um, so the kind of traditional approach to simulating room acoustics is uh, uh, geometric acoustics. So I'll just explain the ray tracing. There's also image source. But in ray tracing, you shoot rays in different directions, and you try to hit some receiver, and this allows you to build an impulse response. Um, you can think about it. This is looking at ray tracing from the point of view of sound particles. So you can 
Um, just imagine some dots propagating along those rays at the speed of sound, and so you can call it a sound particle method. Um, now, if you take enough sound particles, you can kind of reproduce the limit of at least classic geometric acoustics. So these, these are wave fronts, which are just collections of dots. Um, and if you compare it to what's going on with waves, you actually see there's some differences. Um, there's some discontinuities in the wave fronts. This is uh, due to diffraction. So geometric acoustics really has trouble simulating diffraction. Um, so uh, if you looked at a room like this where you would expect a lot of diffusion at the walls, you know, classic geometrical acoustics is just um, insufficient to describe what's going on. So over time, people have developed different techniques to kind of extend geometrical acoustics to do scattering and diffusion. So it's a bit of a heuristic approach, but what you do is you kind of introduce random uh, perturbations of the reflection angle so that you have some sort of diffusion. And then you kind of have to come up with these numbers um, and hope that it approaches something uh, like real life. So you can see, you know, here we have um, some diffuse reflections and if you compare it to the wave solution you see there's some features which are reproduced but then a lot of the fine features are not reproduced. So it, it really depends on if you can hear that or not. So you can look at these two different methods. For example, here we have a cross section of a concert hall. So uh, this is a, a wave simulation and this is a geometric acoustic simulation. And if you've used geometric acoustic software before, you know that you kind of have to simplify the model. Um, so here where I've removed the seats and I introduced some equivalent scattering area. Um, so what happens here is you have these sound particles scattering and they're trying to reproduce something like the wave simulation. But things that, uh, you know, this kind of diffraction, it's not simulated at all. It's very difficult to reproduce that. Um, so this obviously is a, an important example and I'm using the, the model from uh, the group here. Um, and I'll show you kind of two cross, cross sections of this space. And I'm only looking at the, um, the theater without, you know, the back, um, just because this is kind of preliminary. Um, so here I have the sound source in the orchestra pit. So you can see the kind of diffraction that happens over this. Um, this is classic geometrical acoustics, so purely specular reflections. You can see there's a lot missing. Um, you can introduce some scattering and then maybe still diffraction around this corner is not happening, but maybe the, the sound is diffusing a bit more. Um, this is another cross section. So here you can see there's going to be there's quite a lot of diffraction that happens. Um, this really does diffuse the room, and this is hard to simulate with a geometric solution. Um, but, you know, for a long time, this is kind of what was available, so people came up with techniques to, to approach this. But these days, it's possible to actually simulate all these effects. Um, so wave-based methods, so I, all I've been showing you is simulations of wave-based methods. So this is kind of how you um, do these simulations. You start from some partial differential equation that describes the acoustics. So here you have the wave equation in many different forms. So this is in terms of pressure. Um, and essentially you just discretize this equation and solve it in three spatial dimensions. And in theory it's, it's valid for all frequencies because it's actually just the physics that you're discretizing. So it includes all the modes, um, everything that's described by geometric acoustics and all kind of statistical and diffusion. Um, it's all built in. And you don't need to make these assumptions that the room is going to be diffuse. So if the room is not diffuse, you will still recover that. Um, and it's nice if you solve these equations, you get all the sound propagation pass and all the kinds of diffraction. Um, and then, of course, we've, we've seen other wave-based methods. So finite element is another one. I'm going to talk about finite difference methods. But the nice thing to mention is that all of these, in theory, converge to the same solution for a given input data. So uh, that's the kind of reliability that's built into these methods. So this is, so I won't go through too much detail, but this is basically how you do a 3D wave simulation with finite difference methods. So you have some uh, grid function which represents the sound field in space and time. So you have uh, T is time and then three spatial coordinates. And you discretize space on a grid. So here we have a regular Cartesian grid with the grid spacing H. Um, and you would discretize it in time as well, so I can't show you that. And then at every point, you solve for the pressure at that point, 
by looking backwards in time um, and at the neighbors in space. And you kind of do this sum. Um, and yeah, you just do this operation at every point. So it's a very simple operation, but um, it requires many, many points. And this is why it's so costly. So you have to choose the grid spacing based on your uh, frequency of interest. Um, so this is the minimum grid spacing you can choose. And then, because it's in three dimensions, the grid spacing, uh, sorry, the memory costs scale with the inverse cube of the grid spacing. Or another way to put that is uh, with the cube of the frequency of interest. So if you double the frequency of interest, then you have to go, you, you're going to use eight times more memory. And here, you know, you have to have it less than this value, but you often have to have it much less than this value because of errors. Um, so I won't be able to talk about that. But you have this time step k, current number, which goes into here, and uh, there's some stability condition that you need to adhere to. So I'll skip over a lot of details that go into. Um, <laughs> so one, one problem which is really important is staircasing effects. So if you look at this, this model here, this is supposed to be some sort of like theater. Um, and if you discretize it with a bunch of, uh, with a bunch of points, you can, you can kind of interpret those as voxels. And then you have these staircasing issues. So um, one approach that we've been working on is a finite volume generalization. So it's, it's kind of a basic form of finite element. Um, and you, know, you have the freedom to choose cells that, that conform to the boundary so that you can capture a lot more of the effects, I guess, in an accurate way. Um, so here's you know, the difference between staircase and fitted. This is just one approach. So you could use tetrahedrons like, uh, like, the, like in uh, COMSOL. And so what happens is um, if you look at uh, a simulation with staircasing effects, um, you can kind of rotate the, the room or shift it, and you're going to get uh, slight errors and variations. So it becomes hard to trust the, the, the results that you get. So what I'm showing you here is six different simulations of the same room, but under different rotations and different, with different uh, uh, cell types. And you see kind of in the beginning uh, they're coherent, and then quickly they, they kind of vary quite a lot. So you can't really say which one's correct. Um, but if you use fitted cells, so for example, if you use ComSol, you would get the same result. Um, all six simulations give you something uh, co coherent. And it, it kind of tells you that you're getting to the unique solution of, of the problem. Um, and then stability, I didn't get to talk about that too much, but I'll just mention that. Um, so we treat stability using energy uh, approaches. So you kind of describe the whole system in terms of a discrete analog of the physical energy, and you can track this energy over time. And uh, if you add it all up, you, you see that it varies on the, the order of machine precision. So this is a nice tool to verify that your schemes are stable over time. Um, OK, so now how much time do I have? Maybe. OK, so I'll just play some oralizations. So uh, these are sounds that were simulated with finite difference time domain. For, first of all, this cathedral, uh, sorry, concert hall, using a lot of GPUs, but I won't talk about that. So we'll listen to a dry audio uh, that I've injected into this room. So this is the dry source. <laughs> Um, and then this is um, that source injected into the room, and we're going to listen at the kind of back balcony. Okay, that glitching is not part of the audio. <laughs> um, and it's actually hard to evaluate this because we're in a room with its own uh, reverberation. But I'll play an example which exposes some of the errors that you come up with. So first we have this dry audio. So these castanets have a lot of transients and um, they expose a lot of the artifacts that you get in a wave-based simulation. So we'll listen uh, at the back again with this uh, castanet signal. Now, if you listen to the transients, you might hear some sort of chirp, wet. It's, I, I can hear it very easily, but to new people, it's not. 
So this is an artifact that uh, is, is due to um, approximation error, essentially. Um, so one way to get around this is to, you know, use geometric acoustics in the high frequencies. So in this case, I'm, I'm using geometric acoustics above 4 kilohertz, and so we'll listen again now. So now the transients are very crisp. Um, so that's, that's a hybrid wave-based geometric appro approach, which is kind of, uh, yeah, something that you're going to have to do uh, if you don't have enough um, computing power. Um, so finally, this is, uh, so I did some oralizations of the theater model that was presented uh, just a bit earlier. So um, with the sound source in the orchestra pit, um, like I showed before, so we're listening here um, somewhere at the seats, but keep in mind, actually, the seats are not in this model yet, so um, the scattering that would happen due to the seats is not, is not uh, reproduced. And in fact, there's actually a flutter echo. So this is the impulse response that I get. You won't hear the flutter echo in here, but here's the uh, convolved with that cello sound. Okay, we'll just quickly listen at the back um, as well. So this is the impulse response. And then the cello. Okay, I'll conclude now. So, um, modern geometrical acoustics has been around for a long time. It's very fast these days, but ultimately there's some limitations to high frequencies and, and simulating diffraction. Uh, so, wave-based methods, like I, pr I presented here, they're complete in theory, um, but they can be very expensive in practice due to the scaling with the, the frequency. Um, but today, you know, it's actually possible to do wave-based simulations well beyond the shorter frequency. Um, if you have, you know, a few GPUs or a powerful CPU. Um, so it might be a good approach to do these kinds of hybridizations where you do the waves up to 4 or 8 kilohertz and then beyond that you have geometric acoustic assumptions which are probably pretty valid. Um, and so this oralization was very preliminary, so there's a lot of details missing. Um, so it's kind of a work in progress, uh, but a promising um, example to, to work on. And yeah, I'd just like to say there's, and this, some of this has been touched on, but there's, um, there's a lot of, you know, this is kind of a new way of doing things or oralization, so there's a lot of problems that are still to be solved. So it's not like a magic bullet that will, you know, just give you exactly what uh, real life um, sounds like. So there's, for example, you know, how much geometrical detail do you need in, in your model? So you need to reproduce uh, scattering effects. Um, through the ge geometry rather than scattering coefficients. So you have to think about, you know, how much time you're going to spend modeling things like chairs or, you know, details, chandeliers. Um, and then sound transmission. So that's kind of a, a really important problem in low frequencies. Uh, currently we don't have any way to do this, so that's an important um, problem. Um, absorption coefficient data, so like uh, was mentioned before, we need actually impedances. So there's a way to convert from absorption coefficients that are diffused to normal incident uh, absorption coefficients and then to impedances. But, you know, these, these uh, models are, again, they have problems. So, so we need new data. We need to, we need to measure uh, materials in a different way, um, mostly using the kind of impedance tube uh, approach. And then uh, everything that I've played for you was just omnidirectional sources and receivers, so um, introducing directionality is, is also an important thing, so if you wanted to reproduce uh, instruments, for example, or, or, or voice. And then, of course, binaural outputs, so that's an important part of oralization these days. And that's it, so thanks for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have no time for questions because okay. we are a little yeah, bit sorry late. About all the, uh, um, so if, if you have some questions, you can ask yeah. him later during coffee break. Okay. Um, next talk from Roberto Magalotti. The title is Designing for Stability in Low Frequency Loudspeaker Drivers. Good afternoon, everybody. 
I ask you to forgive me if my voice is not very stable, but I'm an introvert, so now my heart rate is through the ceiling. <laughs> Um, I'm Roberto Magalotti, I'm the head of research uh, for BNC Speaker. BNC Speakers is an Italian firm based in Florence, and we do loudspeaker drivers. So this is what uh, I will talk about today. And I will talk in particular about instability in low frequency loudspeakers. Okay, uh, to describe instability in low frequency loudspeakers, we will need both uh, the linear theory of loudspeaker drivers and some nonlinearities. So, the first two points uh, of my presentation will be about the linear uh, loudspeaker model, and I will emphasize these uh, uh, links uh, with a very famous uh, physical model that is the harmonic oscillator. Okay, then I will talk about the main nonlinearities that happen in a, in a woofer, in a low-frequency loudspeaker. And this will allow me to explain what causes dynamic instability in loudspeaker drivers and its main effect that is customarily called DC offset. And then, if uh, there's still time, we will try to play a bit loudspeaker designer and try to understand what we can do about this effect. Okay, so. For those of you who are not very familiar with the loudspeaker, just a minute. Does this work? No? Other side, yeah. Okay, very good. Good. Mm, this is a cutout of a typical woofer, and the electromagnetic part of the woofer is down here. The black block is a permanent magnet that through two polar expansion concentrates uh, the magnetic field in this small slit that is called an air gap. In the air gap, uh, you get a, a voice coil. It's a, it's a simple electrical coil where the, where the audio signal passes as an electrical current. The interaction between the coil and the magnetic field uh, supplies the force that moves the moving assembly up and down in this figure, okay? The moving assembly is made of a cone, a dust cap, this dome down here, and two springs, two mechanical springs, that are called the spider, it's the yellow one, directly glued to the coil former, and the surround, this one up here, okay? Um, as I said, the simplest model of a, of a loudspeaker is the linear model. And since the guys who mm, designed the linear model in the first time were electrical engineers, the easiest way, the most natural way for them to describe a linear model was through a circuit, okay? So this is the equivalent circuit of a loudspeaker. The idea is that we, mm, as long as everything is linear, as long as everything can be described as a um, lumped parameter, we can draw everything as a circuit. But as is often said, the loudspeaker is an electroacoustic transducer. And to be more precise, it's an electromechanical acoustical transducer. So we are going through three different physical domains. So we have actually two different transformers. So shortly. The part on, on the left is the purely electrical part of the device and uh, represents basically the, the voice coil. The voice coil has an electrical resistance and of course an inductance. The first transformer is the loudspeaker motor and it has the goal of transforming electrical current into force. The force is then applied to the mechanical part and the mechanical part is simply described as a moving mass a spring, and some resistance, some mechanical losses, okay? Then there's the cone down here. The cone performs the second transduction from mechanical movement to acoustics, so to sound. And the elements down here are simply the radiation impedance, so the, the reaction of the fluid of the medium to the movement of the cone, okay? So, um, the interesting thing is that 
if you focus on your attention on those three elements, you might well recognize a very famous model. Okay? It's exactly the same thing. The harmonic oscillator and the mechanical part of the loudspeaker are exactly the same thing. The moving mass that is uh, depicted as, a, as, a, as an inductance in this case, the spring uh, has a compliance uh, instead of a stiffness, but it's only a mathematical detail, okay? And the resistance I itself uh, is, a, is a viscous drag as a damper. Then you can add everything you want. You, you add a, a, a forcing, uh, a, a for an external force that uh, uh, moves uh, the loudspeaker back and forth. What is important in all of these uh, is that uh, we know a lot of things about the harmonic oscillator, and we can exploit the these in the analysis of the loudspeaker. For example, one of the things we know about the oscillator um, is that the resonance frequency actually splits the frequency range in three different bands, below, around, and above the resonance. And they are called stiffness-dominated region, resistance-dominated regions, mass-dominated regions, okay? If we use this knowledge in the loudspeaker, we will see that we will have a certain kind of phase relationship between the electrical current that is proportional to force and the displacement of the moving assembly. So in the stiffness dominated region, they are simply proportional to each other. In the resistance dominated region, we, we will have uh, a direct proportionality between force and velocity. So the displacement will lag, as you see in the, in, in the center. And in the last one, that is the most important for us, uh, Today, in the mass dominated region, we will have current and uh, force, uh, sorry, current and displacement exactly opposite in, in phase. We could think of the behavior of the loudspeaker in the mass dominated region more or less like a girl on a swing, with the parents supplying force at the extremes of the movement. And this will help us to remember that to the maximum forward movement will correspond the maximum backward force, okay? So much for the linear model. Now we will go to the non-linear model. Now, um, the linear model has a long history in loudspeakers, and uh, the detailed analysis of non-linearities um, is much more recent, but it was only natural to use the existing model and uh, expand upon that. So the easiest way to describe even the nonlinear model is to draw an electrical circuit, okay? The main difference be between this circuit and the one I showed you some minutes ago is that many of the uh, parameters are not constant anymore. They have dependencies on displacement, they have dependencies on electrical current, some even on temperature, okay? But fortunately, for today, we need only concern us uh, with two of those nonlinearities. I would say the, the most important ones. The first one is the nonlinearity of the force factor. As I said, the force factor is the conversion parameter between uh, current and force. Its dimension is Newton per ampere, exactly, okay? I get I push a certain current through the coil, I get a certain force out of it. This is a cutout of the uh, loudspeaker motor. And of course, most of the B field is concentrated in the air gap. So when I have my voice coil inside the air gap, I get, of course, the maximum amount of magnetic field. But the coil is designed to move. And when the coil moves in and out of the motor, of course, the BL factor drops. And it produ produces typically this kind of bell-shaped curve that you see up here, okay? This is displacement, this is BL. Something similar can be said about the, st the stiffness of the suspension system. Hmm? 
because ideally they should be a perfect uh, spring, so a force proportional to displacement. But actually what happens most of the time is that uh, those suspensions are a stiffening spring. So the more you push them, the harder they become. And if you plot uh, stiffness versus displacement, you get a typical U curve like this. Okay, now we know everything we need to understand, uh, um, to understand instability. But uh, not to be too abstract, I prefer to show you what happens with a real loudspeaker. So, we do a little ID chart uh, ID card of a loudspeaker. These are the most important linear parameter of a loudspeaker. And I will use a loudspeaker having this motor strength, a 5.1 ohm electrical resistance for the coil, a pretty large moving mass, 272 gram, it's, uh, it's an 18 inch. The total quality factor uh, describes uh, the total damping from all effects in the, in the loudspeaker. Last but not least, there's a typical sound pressure level measured in specified conditions, okay? These are the basics. Nonlinearities, these are the nonlinearities of these loudspeakers, and as you see, they are pretty typical uh, curves, like the ones I've shown you before. Okay, so first thing, I try to simulate the response of my loudspeaker to a sinusoidal signal using only the linear model. And what happens is very clean, okay? Perfectly symmetrical and everything. If I add nonlinearities to my loudspeaker, what happens is this. So what happens is actually that the average uh, position of the loudspeaker is completely out of the gap. Instead of oscillating between uh, minus seven and plus seven millimeters, like in the blue curve, you get something that oscillates between uh, uh, plus five and almost plus 20 millimeter. So it's completely out. You can, uh, you can usually see it very clearly uh, with the naked eye. Let's try to understand what happened to our girl on the swing. If mom and dad go to the gym together, they supply the same amount of force, and this is the ideal situation, and the girl stays more or less in between. But if mom goes to the gym and dad stays on the couch, what happens is that the girl will spend much more time on her dad's side, okay? Back to loudspeakers. If I am in a portion of the BL curve where, where there is strong variation in the BL value, and I am in mass-dominated region, the force that is received by the moving assembly at the extremes of the movement is not balanced anymore. So along a complete cycle, I will get a net force in the outdoor, outward direction. And this behavior is unstable because it tends to push the moving assembly farther away from the rest position. Is this good? Not at all. This thing is called DC offset, with a, with a term taken from uh, amplifier's theory, okay? And the main effects are all negative, because I have efficiency reduction. I'm working in a zone where the BL is slower. I have an increase in nonlinear distortion, because again, I'm working in a region where the parameter variations are larger. I have mechanical stress. My springs are not exercised on both sides, are exercised only on one side. And last but not least, I will have worse heat transfer, because the voice coil uh, transfer heat mostly to, their iron, to, to the iron parts. So power handling will be worse, and uh, uh, expect, expected life of the loudspeaker will be worse. So in short, what can we do against this? 
We can design stiffer suspensions because they are the ones that keep the loudspeaker close to the rest position. We could use a weaker motor. We could, we could use a teller winding or we can use a split coil that is a device that I will show you in, uh, in a minute. This needs to be very fast, but in short, stiffening the suspension reduces the C offset, but do, does not remove completely it. It has the advantage that does not change linear parameters. Okay? I could use a weaker motor, so have a, uh, smaller values on all the B curve. This one has more or less the same effect, but is de detrimental for efficiency. It's cheaper. The only advantage is that paying a smaller magnet usually costs less. I can use a taller winding that apparently rises all the BL curve, but I'm also increasing weight, I'm increasing resistance, and in the end, the efficiency is suffering. It is actually effect effective. It removes DC offset, but the displacement is smaller. So I will have smaller sound pressure level. This is a split coil. On the right, you see a usual uh, moving coil for a woofer with a double layer inside and outside the corner. In the split coil, there are some turns removed from the center part of the external layer. Okay? With this uh, strategy, you get a curve like this that is flatter and slightly smaller only in the center part. The effect is much better than the taller winding, okay? So, short summary. We've seen linear and nonlinear loudspeaker theory. We've seen that dynamic instability happens in mass control range and depends on the shape of the BL versus displacement curve. And the only thing that counteracts it is the stiffness of the spring system, okay? Then we have rapidly seen some design strategy and how they are effective and what are the cons of each strategy. That's all for today. Thank you for your, for your attention. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We have time for a, a, a quick uh, question. If there's one. Mm. That's an excellent question. Uh, it depends a lot because uh, it's typically a, a, um, a dynamic that is uh, one order of magnitude slower than the typical audio dynamics. So it takes usually some tenths of a second to reach uh, the stable position. But since it's a threshold behavior, you can get two, three seconds uh, or uh, one tenth of a second. But the typical, the typical range in, is, is this one. Well, the typical region is in the descending part of the impedance uh, peak because here you get the perfect storm of uh, right uh, phase shift and uh, mm, good displacement. When you go further in frequency, the displacement becomes low, low and usually does not trigger this kind of phenomenon. But uh, the one I've, I've shown you had a resonance frequency of 32 hertz, and the signal was 70 hertz. So that's pretty typical. Thank you. Next one, please. Um. Next one.
And uh, one more quite interesting thing is uh, with the autocorrelation function analysis. The sound has much longer uh, correlation time. And uh, it's very useful to make the uh, uh, invisibility or uh, the clarity of the all degree uh, comprehension. And uh, we are not me, myself, but uh, within our university, Tokyo University, are starting to utilize something like this for hearing aids or some uh, uh, entrepreneurship for the sustainable society, especially for aging society and so forth. But uh, the most important thing, or the most uh, uh, huge problem is, uh, how do you think, uh, how much is it cost for one seat? <laughs> how do you think, Professor Kobe? <laughs> this is not so, uh, indeed, uh, this is not so beautifully made because I personally am hungry, but uh, it, it cost more than 500 euro and uh, so by now still rather expensive but uh, I think this is indeed a very uh, kick off this but uh, I hope uh, you have some interest in this so several characteristics of the film speakers I see a report at the kick off phase this is so still very natural and uh, so Outline is a, this is a film speaker, but uh, we have measured uh, two different kinds of smells. One is ordinary, somehow magnetic, and uh, the other is piezoelectric, just you have heard. And uh, for both cases, we used a so called, we named this a stressed resonance and so forth. And, uh, uh, they have some uh, resonance with longer correlation time. And uh, both verbal and non-verbal sound information much clearer than that of short correlation time. And also uh, the possible application for hearing aids. And piezoelectric, it means uh, non-magnetic film speakers have excellent characteristics. Uh, but uh, it has many, many, uh, first of all, very expensive. And but, but, uh, without any uh, magnet or even metal, we can design something completely different. Of course, uh, these are very newly made, uh, but uh, I think I have some conviction, uh, as I am a professor of music and a practical musician, and a, um, I must say, totally amateur in uh, fabrication, but uh, I'd like to share those information. So the first uh, uh, reason I started something like this is uh, when I was in uh, Clemona at the Deuteria, we had started some uh, collaboration, and uh, they had uh, some puzzle in the uh, sound post. Why are they very important? And I have some uh, physical background, and uh, immediately an idea of a nonlinear coupling of the two balls uh, would make something uh, resonant. 
and I have written uh, during my in, uh, university school age. I have done some uh, theoretical and experimental physics, but uh, I stopped when I was 24 and 25. But uh, I did it. And uh, so this is so-called the sound post. The, this is the case of the violoncello that you can see from the F, uh, the, uh, something like this. Uh, I shall use this one. Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. How do I operate this to put? Beautiful. Yeah, this one. This is so-called sound post. And uh, this is quite a simple modelization. But the two boards are coupled with a piece of wood. Uh, and uh, otherwise, if we remove it, almost no, nothing. Why? This is very important and a very interesting theme. And I have uh, solved very tiny, very simple uh, differential equation and so forth. And indeed, uh, the violin instrument is not a box, but uh, with stressed two balls are combined with only glues and so forth. And it can make some very rich uh, freedom in vibration. And so also a very important thing is a violin instrument is not at all hi-fi, not at all uh, linear, but uh, they are very rich in musical expression, and which I love. And uh, also here, this is very interesting. Uh, So-called the bridge and uh, the sound post stresses are less just like this S shape. And uh, this makes something. Uh, I can't say <laughs> precisely, but uh, in case if they are, oh, what comes? Can I ask? Uh, oh, 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 oh. If we put uh, it is straightforward, it is not no good. This is also a part of with some of the crisp craftsmen. And uh, nobody knows uh, the true reason, but uh, at least uh, some S shaped. Uh, S-shaped stress is very important. This is a, a traditional uh, wisdom, especially the Cremona Italian uh, tradition. I have learned from you. And then I, I'd like to have another simple model, but uh, we can uh, make more knowledge about the uh, uh, instrument uh, technology or instrumental wisdom for a music, very useful for music making. And then now, I uh, would like to uh, change or enlarge the topics. I'm so sorry. Absorption. <laughs> then, nonlinear. <laughs> Uh, conducting polymers and a piezo polymer. Uh, I'm not at all chemist, but the so-called conducting polymers. Uh, this is a case of a P dot. P E dot is a, a the bro mode of the, I'm not sure. <laughs> but, uh, uh, this is a, um, a molecule of a single P dot. This is so-called nanotube, very tiny tube. And uh, it uh, clearly shows uh, this is uh, also very new novelty after 2005, 6, 7, 8. And, uh, but uh, a kind of conductive uh, um, polymer, uh, organic polymer. And uh, they are just like this. And uh, oh, so, so, no, 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 no. This is a P dot. The change. current road for current with a pi electrodes. And uh, even though they are organic materials, but uh, think of our neuron itself. 
we are made of organic molecules that uh, our neural, neural system can uh, very clearly transmit uh, uh, signals, input, and so forth. And in this case, or in, you, you, have, you must have something like this, and uh, touching. And uh, here uh, is uh, the almost the same structure, the flexible polymers, but uh, with a very thin uh, waves for uh, transmitting the current. This is the core of conducting polymers. And uh, se no, no. <laughs> Secondary, piezo polymer film. This is also very interesting uh, material. Uh, this is a, also uh, the film of uh, nanotubes of uh, cellulose, uh, just like sugar, or very uh, near to plant uh, glasses. But uh, with a, I thought this is a very interesting point. And uh, put a cellulose in, some in, uh, in between two electrodes and uh, at a very high voltage and cool and something like this. Uh, they are some secret <laughs> in uh, enterprises. So I do not know this actually. But the uh, most important thing is making those nanotubes in such layer form. And uh, they could work as a piezo, uh, on one thing, piezo uh, sensor. And uh, also, it uh, naturally means piezo speaker. We can make piezo speaker and piezo sensor together. Piezo and uh, polarized piezo electric uh, SLOs film um, is, uh, I, I have missed that, but uh, something like this. And uh, I uh, was uh, proposed from a uh, chemist, Dr. Professor Hideki Shirakawa. He is uh, the Nobel laureate in the chemistry in 2000, but uh, very, uh, is until now very uh, industrious in laboratories and uh, making something like this. And uh, fortunately, he had from, uh, proposed us to do something like this all together. And the problem to be solved is how can we create pure polymer film speaker? This is the question. And uh, the reason why he asked us is that this is by now totally out of business, very expensive, <laughs> and uh, most in vain. But I will try it. The merits are magnet free and almost no heat loss, and the plasticity, ETC, ETC, ETC. But we have still a long, long way. So conventional, I'm some not in good sense conventional, but traditional magnetic speakers, the signals are given as a cha changes of current and so forth. Just a maestro had a very precisely uh, given the beautiful lecture. But uh, in this case, PP magnet, uh, so the, just I have shown with uh, uh, old gold's case, free non-stressed a uh, propylene uh, film can uh, make uh, some uh, non-linear uh, amplification. And uh, with a bent stressed situation, uh, the power is much more. But uh, totally out of a hi-fi. But still, is a very uh, suitable for uh, integral, uh, clearly a uh, transmission of the verbal meaning. The pure polymer piezoelectric film speaker is something like this. Uh, the substance is sandwiches with two electrodes. Of course, we can put the metals over there. But in metals case, metal. And uh, Dr. Shiraka would like to make uh, the pure uh, organic material polymer. Uh, and uh, the most important thing is the signal is given with voltage, no current, and this is capacitor, and the organic material, almost no conduction, and uh, almost no ohmic heat. And uh, this is somehow uh, revolutionary, at least for me, but uh, not so efficient. And uh, so we have uh, performed the two kinds of very basic, two kinds, no, the two kinds of uh, measurement. Uh, first is a band noise from zero to 10 kilo and uh, for piezoelectric. And uh, this is the free and bent. That you can see very flat, uh, almost a no uh, characteristic uh, resonance and so forth. Where with the And uh, especially at the beginning, <laughs> you can clearly see. So, one minute, okay. And uh, so, this is a different view, but uh, you can clearly see something like this. And also, uh, we 
and it had a sweep, a sinusoidal sweep for a magnetic uh, film speaker. And you can see many, many noises and artifacts and so forth. Where? For piezoelectric scales, something like this. Much clearer and a much better, of course, not at all perfect, but uh, we can in, uh, safely say this has some possibility and we'd like to continue with this. So problem to be said, uh, they are so hydrophobic phenomena substance and the hydrophilic substance all together. So there should be some uh, solution. And I'm not at a chemist and we'd like to start some collaboration with chemists. And uh, also they are somehow uh, expensive. But also, uh, this is uh, somehow uh, fun, but the fundamental question is, uh, uh, for example, uh, how can the plants sense the word and so forth? And uh, they have no new level system, no neuron, but uh, they are made of, their bodies are made of cellulose, and there could be something. And uh, this is uh, some open question uh, Professor Shirakawa had gave, gave us. And uh, they are also still very in, uh, uh, expensive and a small piece uh, used for the sensors. But uh, um, indeed, uh, we are just uh, starting something like this. So summary is uh, we measured different several, uh, magnetic and non-magnetic non uh, speakers. And the piezoelectric speaker have some very uh, good uh, characteristic. And uh, we'd like to continue uh, this way. And uh, uh, always uh, we are open to uh, international collaboration. Especially we are uh, completely amateur in, uh, in uh, loudspeaker fabrication. Thank you very much. Thank you. Questions? No questions? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for... <laughs> the session of low frequencies is finished, so now there's coffee break and the poster session.